we, we do tend to get some stranger ideas about Jesus. Um, looks different from here, I've got to say that. So, um, maybe turn that down a bit. Alright. See, growing up, I grew up in a very orthodox kind of family. I don't care what I say, because they're up in the back row there. But um, me, growing up as a child, I never understood how the Jews in, in the first century Palestine never knew who Jesus was and that he was the Messiah, because... I mean, I had access to a lot of the, you know, the Middle Age art and Renaissance period, and I always thought, well, how could they not knew Jesus was God? He was the only six foot tall, blonde hair, blue eye, blowing halo around, and the angels going everywhere he went. But it um, turns out Jesus was not quite how I imagined when I uh, was growing up, and I think sometimes we do get some funny ideas about God and Jesus and, and how he relates to us in the world. So um, before we start trying to unpack some of that, maybe we should uh, let's pray. Father, how amazing it is that you've created a world and that out of all your creations, you know the, the names of every star in the sky and they exalt you with, with every moment, but you favoured us and you chose us to bear your image. Father, we just want to do honour to, to your name and your image. And uh, tonight as we, we explore a bit about what that means, I just want to pray that it, it's your words and uh, not, not the words of man or any, any single book head with a microphone, but that it's the words of you, the, the, the Alpha, the Omega, that the one who is beyond anything and yet still saw reason to love us. In Jesus' name, Amen. Those of you with Bibles might want to open up to Colossians, chapter 1, 15 to 23. I've got my notes here. I just want this to make it look like they're a bit bigger. For he is the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and things on earth, things visible and invisible. Whether it's by thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that everything, in everything, he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell within him. Heaven, sorry, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth, things in heaven, difficult going back and forth by the way, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behaviour. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you wholly in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope, held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you have heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, into which I, Paul, Michael, have become a servant. So tonight, we're going to have a look about this concept that I like to call theology. Theology is, we call it portmanteau in layman's language. It's a mashup of a couple of words. Theos, meaning God. Reality, everything else. And we create theology, this existence built on the actuality of God. Now, those of you connected with the internet and Facebook will have probably seen this a bit. I'll get the shameless plug over and done with now because this is actually what inspired me to talk tonight about this. Um, this is what I, why I've actually named my, uh, my webcomic and my website about theology because I want to make a very big challenging statement that sometimes we need to look closer at the world we're in. Sometimes we, we should never let ourselves get entirely comfortable. Um, in, I believe, Thessalonians, that it said to us that we should test all things and, and hold fast to that which is true. So tonight I want to challenge all of you just to, to have a think about the world we're in and just how God relates to that world. So um, let's, let's have a look tonight at what we're looking at. Three points. Theality 101 consists of reality versus theality. What are the two? What are the differences? Then we're going to ask why theology? Why should we look at theology over reality? What's, what's somehow special about a, God, a world built on the existence and the actuality of God? 
And thirdly, one of the most important questions, how do we relate to this notion of fiality? Because if it's not about relationship, let's face it, I don't want any part of it. So uh, let, let's have a look at reality versus theality. What does that look like? Well, we take our world and we center it on God. I like that, that's quite cool. We center our world around God. God is at the center of our lives. You often hear talk about a God-centered life. Is God at the forefront? Is He at the center of your life? Well, let's have a look at what that actually looks like when we get down to the, the bare bones over the details. I actually like to think of reality as an Old Testament model. God was in the holy place. God was at the center of all of Israel's culture, of their history, of their social structure. God was right in the middle of it. Um, who's read the book of Leviticus? Anyone? Yep. Is there not a lot of rules involved in, in uh, Leviticus? Who would actually like to live under that system? That's a good deal less hands than the first question. So, our proximity to God, when we place Him in the center of our lives, is basically on our efforts. We can, uh, we can wander away and leave God over there somewhere, and we actually have to drag ourselves up to get back close to God in the center of our lives. Imagine, uh, I, I could come up with a, a random Israeli name, but they're all very difficult. So let's just say uh, Joe Israelite. And he is going to, uh, to have himself a bit of a God moment. I'm going to unpack what that looks like uh, as we, we talk about reality for a few minutes. The first problem is when Joe Israelite is talking about God as the center of his life, it's very easy, and we see all throughout the Old Testament how easy it is that God's over there and he's in the center of our lives. This thing looks really interesting. Let's put that in there for a while and see how that goes. Anyone familiar with Old Testament history knows it doesn't really work too well, and yet we keep doing it. We keep doing it today. So um, how does that work? Well, because we tend to value things via proximity. <laughs> So um, we, we tend to, let, let's have a look at how that works in the, in the Old Testament world. We tend, we, we put God in the center of our lives and if we can be honest, sometimes we, we tend to think that we've got it worked out. God is in the center of our lives and um, this, this thing over here, we, we don't know what it is, but it's quite far away from God. So somehow it's not as important. And um, it's a bit troubling because that's where we're called to be. We're called to be where God isn't and show them how to, to come to God. And even that can get a bit tricky because where is it God? And I find it, it can give a bit of a headache because how on earth, who are we to judge? When, when God says to Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth, when I put all the stars in the sky, extrapolating a bit from all the things God's done, why do we get to judge? But we hold on to this idea that this is not how I do things. And so somehow, it's value or devalue. And what that means is, Joe Israelite's going to go have himself a God moment. Because, how does this work? Well, let's just say he's going to visit the holy place. And uh, this doesn't mean he wakes up in the morning and says, I think it's time to go pray. This actually starts at least a week beforehand. Again, who's familiar with uh, what it takes to get into the holy place if you've read the Old Testament? Who wants to actually, there's a few hands, who wants to go through that every time they want to come to church? Sensing a pattern here in the second of those question pairs. Well, um, he starts by abstaining from an awful lot of things. Things that Joe Islite probably doesn't want to abstain from. He'll stop eating a lot of foods. He'll stop partaking in a lot of activities. He'll, uh, he'll stop having a lot of relationships that he probably enjoys. Then he's going to wake up on the morning of going to the temple. He's going to comb his hair in a very special way. He's got his special clothes that he's going to put on and he's going to tie his knots around his robes in a very special way. Joe Israelite might be taking a, um, an offering to the temple. Well, who's actually familiar with how we tie those things up before we kill them in the Old Testament? 